Session six is about constructive alignment. And we have three facilitators. I'm sure you've seen us um, participating with you all along. My name is Rita Kizito. I'm the teaching and learning specialist in the science faculty. Um, my colleagues is Nomakaya Mashi, who's a teaching and learning specialist in the EMS faculty. And a person who you see coming in and out, out is Professor Delia Marshall, who was a de former deputy dean of teaching and learning in the science faculty. So, Delia really has a lot to do with what we are doing right now. They are the pioneers of what we are doing in teaching and learning. So what are we going to do in this session? It's going to be a very active session. So if you look on your table, there are certain things that we're going to be using. There's an empty matrix. We don't intend to fill it today, but I hope they're starting at least. We are going to start filling it today. There's also an example of somebody else's matrix, but I'm sure you have yours. And then we also have an evaluation form. But basically what we're going to do today are those three things. So hopefully by the end of this session, we would be able to identify elements of the teaching system and explain why we need them aligned. We are going to look at the guy or the theorist who did a lot of constructive alignment, just engage with what his intention was and get our own interpretation. And then the last one will be a real practical exercise. As I said, this constructive alignment is a process. We're just going to begin it it today, but hopefully you will take it along and use it as we go along. So I'm going to ask Kaya to come and start with the first part. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. You will notice that on your desks, you also have this handout. You only have two or three uh, desks. The first one is entitled curriculum alignment. The second one, uh, Bloom's taxonomy, the revised one. And then you have a comparison of the original Bloom's taxonomy and the revised one. And um, like Rachel has said, there's going to be a lot of activity this time around. We can see. We're going to be looking at constructive alignment. But before we talk about what constructive alignment alignment is, I would like us to to have um, a warm up activity. What is your understanding of a system? If we say teaching is a system, what is your understanding of a system, and why would you regard teaching as a system? Can you talk to the person next to you? I give you just one second to do that. <laughs> <laughs> So the two questions are, <coughs> if we regard teaching as a system, what would you say is your understanding of the system? And why would you regard teaching as a system? Yeah. We said um, it could be a form of guidance 
Were you directing the student towards where you want them to go? Uh -huh. And why is it a system? Oh, a system. You mentioned, you're mentioning just one element within the teaching system, which is good. You mentioned what? The actual teaching activity itself. Right? What are the other elements within the system? Well, I think what you said think you about what you do in the classroom. Mm -hmm. What are the elements involved? So a system is a series of processes, structures, rules that produce a specific product. Mm -hmm. So you have your inputs, the transformation, and the outputs. That's all? Mm -hmm. cool. Anything else? electronic systems, mm -hmm. all towards teaching and learning, uh -huh. and the coherence uh -huh. in that system. So we're talking here about a coherent system that is made up of quite a number of elements that work together. Not so? Okay. Now here's what I would like you to do. I'm sure you have sheets of paper with you. I would like you to draw a diagram representing your teaching system, quickly. When you get inside a lecture hall, even before getting inside a lecture hall, you do some preparatory work. What, what is involved? This one? This one? Oh. I assume that they will bring their own writing materials. How do you conceptualize teaching? <laughs> Mm. Well, and is the also would obviously be the I don't have any questions right now. We've mentioned already some of the teaching elements. Of course, Brian is speaking, spoke about inputs, the transformation that we can, and outputs, not so. But that's not the whole story. I want you to identify all the elements that make up the teaching system. The clock is ticking. One minute gone. We, 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 we would like you to identify elements in your own teaching system. That, that's a part that's going to be confusing, I can say it, but I know mm. it's going to be correct now. Okay, now don't worry about correct now, okay. go ahead. As this, so the means that you do, like mm -hmm. discussions and stuff like that, your approach to teaching, I guess? Before you reach that part where you talk about group discussions, your methods, that is, not so, uh -huh. your techniques out there, your case studies, the, the teaching, learning activities, what, what have you to what, what do you have to think about first? Good answer? Aims and your goals. You think about your aims and your goals. Why am I having this lesson? What do I want to achieve? Not to achieve. Okay. You also need to know the content. Okay. You have to think about the content. In fact, it is the aims or outcomes that lead you to the content. Your learning objectives. Your learning objectives will be your outcomes. Yes. Well, in the past we used to talk about behavioral objectives, but now what do we talk about? We talk about outcomes. Yes. 
what we want our students to achieve, the intended learning outcome. Okay? In our lessons, we always cover intended learning outcomes only. What about unintended consequences? Unintended outcomes? Anyway, so we've mentioned aims and outcomes. We've also mentioned the content, not so? Okay. What else? Sorry, I, I was thinking about the, on a very broad level, the national orientation uh, system uh, and how qualifications fall within that and how that comes down to influence what you do in your small course and how that's got to align with uh, the qualifications and standards that are set nationally. Uh, yeah. uh, and how that trickles down to the classroom. Yes, Besides the national regulatory framework that she's talking about, we've mentioned outcomes and aims, we've mentioned methods, how am I, I mean, we've mentioned content, what am I going to teach, not to. Okay. Assessments, yes. What about assessment? Where would you place assessment? I'm just I started with our quality, our professional body, and the institution mm -hmm. and all the policies. And, like, the so in your discipline, the professional body is very important. Yeah. It actually prescribes mm -hmm. for you what to teach, yes. not so? Okay. What else? And out of that, I form my curriculum, and then the people that's involved, these are students, and mm -hmm. then the non-academic and academic staff, and we've got mentors because it's a profession, the hospitals and the CHCs. Um, also the places where we teach is in the hospitals, here, yeah, and the setting, where the teaching and learning is yeah. So I, I will look at the road. Okay. Anything else that you think we've left out? Mention the national regulatory framework, the outcomes, the aims, the methods, the content, the assessments. There's something else that you've left out. I'm not sure that I was not going to be the future of students. I need to be the first thing, second thing. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. I don't need to be teaching levels, <coughs> also maybe speak to the level of the students. Uh -huh. But the way you engage the students, the post that you build is different in different environments. Exactly. The way you handle the foundation program, students will be slightly different from the way you would handle your mainstream students. Because those are usually students who are really at risk in Okay? So something else we're living out. How do you get to know the effect of your teaching? How effective you are in your teaching? What do you do? The evaluation, that's all. Evaluation of teaching and evaluation of courses, that's all. Okay? You get feedback from students about how they perceive your teaching, that's all. What do you usually do with this feedback? Adjust your practice. Pardon? Adjust your you practice. adjust your practice. Ideally, that's what you should be doing. But it's like <laughs> For what other purpose do we use evaluation? Promotion. Promotion. When you get appraised, when you want to become a professor, an associate professor, a full professor, you have to submit a portfolio, not so? <laughs> mm -hmm. And inside the portfolio, you have your student evaluations, not so? That, in a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen, would be the elements that make a teaching system, not so? Now, Biggs argues that it, the elements within a teaching system have to be Aligned, not so. Okay. What do you think that means? You've got a reading by Reeves on constructive alignment, not so. Okay. What does that mean? Constructive alignment. The building blocks have to fit together. Mm -hmm. The building blocks have to fit together. Now, if you look at the phrase, I call it a phrase, constructive alignment, do you have? Constructive and then alignment. The first part is taken from constructivism, which is a learning theory, not so. And what does it say? 
What is constructivism about? It's about constructing meaning. Mm -hmm. It's about the student constructing meaning and you acting as, as a guide. And how do you facilitate this process? Look at what I'm doing now. Am I giving you answers? Am I giving you answers all the way? What am I doing? I'm asking questions that are going to set you thinking about answers to my questions all together. Okay? So in a way, I am forcing you to think about your everyday practice in the classroom. All right? So constructivism is about creating an opportunity for your students to construct knowledge. Okay. Right? For example, how do you do that? They could work in groups. <coughs> they could work individually. They could work in cooperative paths. They could use technology altogether. Then the alignment part, we've got two concepts brought together, constructivism and and alignment. The alignment part, what, 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 what do you think that means? <coughs> the alignment part involves what? You're making sure that all these elements work together, not so. Now we will later on demonstrate how that can be achieved using this matrix. All right? We will demonstrate how that can be achieved using this matrix. Okay. The other element that I think we've left out would be our graduate attributes. UWC graduate attributes. Do you remember what they are about? Okay. We have two tiers, not so. Three. Is it three? Two. Two. We've got two. two. <laughs> <laughs> We've got two tiers, that's all. Yeah. If you want to make it easier for yourself, just regard the UWC graduate attributes as your learning outcomes, what you want your students to achieve. Mm -hmm. all right? The skills and competences that you want your students to achieve, so that when they get to the world of work, they have these relevant skills and can function the way they are expected to, all together. How much time do I have left? I have enough time. <laughs> now let me look at my presentation. <laughs> can you collect all the, all the post-its and what they've written on there awesome. so that you can put it up? Now let's quickly go through what, what, what I've prepared here on the various elements within a teaching system. The first one here I've said would be the learning outcomes. They specify intended learning, they guide learning, they lead you to the content. The way you write them would be, you'd have, for example, outcomes for a semester, for a week, for a session, for a year, all right? How do you plan together as lecturers in your discipline? Do you sit together first year, second year, third year, and get to know what's being taught at each level? Do you do that? Or do you remain in your small little corner and do the best way you know how? Do your curriculum divide the best way you know how? Is that, a, is that what we do? Every man for himself. <laughs> well, I'm hoping after this session, people will go back and talk to their colleagues so that they know what is happening in the first year, second year, and third year, as well as align outcomes throughout the program, all together. Okay. There are three groups of outcomes. These would be the intellectual capabilities, skills, attitudes, and values. Not a, which ones are the easiest to assess? in your experience, as actually. The intellectual, intellectual one. Mm -hmm. If you look at, for example, what I've put on your desks, I have here, can I use oh, Bloom's taxonomy? Mm -hmm. If you look at Bloom's taxonomy, at the bottom you have the revised one, the revised taxonomy, Bloom's revised taxonomy. I only have two copies per desk. 
You will see at the bottom you have remembering. Those are low level questions that require students to report. You have understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, creating, not so. Okay? Now, it is these active verbs that help you put together your learning outcomes in a way which makes it very clear to you what it is that your students have achieved. All right? Now, say, for example, in your, in your paper, you said a question like, um, what is what is the capital city of, of, of the Republic of South Africa? <laughs> what kind of question is that? Close-ended, open-ended? Close-ended. So where would you place it there? Is it requiring the student to remember, understand, apply, <laughs> analyze, evaluate, create? It's remembering, it's testing, remembering. So that's a low-order question altogether. But if you ask your students to create something, to design something, those would be at the higher end of Lucas Group 7. You know so? Mm -hmm. so what is this saying to us? What, is, what this is saying is that when we are designing outcomes, we need to make sure that the outcomes are cognitively demanding, not so. Especially at university level. All right? Mm. I don't know if I'm being pedantic here, but when, when you ask about what's the easiest to assess, I think intellectual capabilities, it would more be academic performance because that's where you're showing what you're doing, whereas capabilities is more what you're capable of. That, that, that's not necessarily apparent. You know, it might be the potential you have. I, I'm just raising it because with outcomes, we're trying to be so specific. Yeah. What do others think? What would be the easiest to assess? Intellectual, <coughs> skills, attitudes and values? What would be the easiest to, to assess? Generally, in your own discipline. Skills. 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 Because they have to do what? To demonstrate something altogether. Like resuscitate a patient altogether. Okay. Attitudes and values, are they very easy to evaluate? To assess? No, you infer from the behavior, right? Okay. Now, even when designing assessment criteria, you can use Bloom's taxonomy. And remember, Bloom is not the only taxonomy we have. We have other taxonomies altogether. Hmm? How many minutes? <coughs> so we have to use active verbs. That's what I'm trying to, to put across. Now we're looking at content as the second element, okay? How much content must you put into your course? What guides your decisions? You look at the number of credits, you look at the content time, you look at timetabling, not so? If you look at a degree or a program that stretches over three years, usually how many credits do you have there? Usually. It's usually 360, not so. If it's a four-year degree, it's usually 480. If it's a diploma, it's, it's 120. Now, the amount of content that you put in a diploma wouldn't be the same as the amount of content that you put into a, into a degree program. That's what I'm trying to illustrate. So you have to decide on essential knowledge that your students must know, what they should know, or you could also beef up the content. You could also decide on the nice to know. Not so? Okay? But all of this has to be reflected in your outcomes. Then the third element would be the assessment standards, the assessment criteria. What evidence do I need from my students? What evidence do I need to do, do they need to demonstrate to me that they've understood what what, what, what I've been teaching them. For this, you design rubrics. Do we use rubrics in our teaching? Mm -hmm. okay. What do rubrics specify? Mm -hmm. Various competences, levels of, of competence. Are we together? Mm -hmm. okay. 
Would it be a good idea to design the, the rubric with your students? What do you think? Or should this be an exercise that is done by the lecturer only? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Well, I think that we should design it and then we can share with our lessons. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I mean, we can In the interest <laughs> of transparency and fairness, we need to be open about the whole design process altogether. Mm -hmm. So that students know exactly what is expected of them. They don't challenge the mark that you give them in an assignment, for example. Hmm? Um, if you have a system, you can go in the beginning and get new students. So maybe you adjust uh -huh. as you go along. But uh -huh. I think at the design phase, they wouldn't be so involved. Okay. Or perhaps you could design them and then discuss them with your students. Is that what you say? No, what I'm saying is you have a new group of students every year. Mm. So you will maybe adjust it. Mm -hmm. Um, so they will have some input. Okay. The teaching learning activities, they are central to learning. Okay? You must design them in such a way that they promote deep learning. Right? Deep learning is about sense making. Instead of asking questions that don't challenge students and, and give them an opportunity to construct knowledge, make sure that you design activities that are challenging. So what the student does is very important to achieve these outcomes. So the central question here when you're designing activities would be, why have you selected these methods in your subject or discipline? And also it's important to note that each method or technique has its own strengths and, and weaknesses. Can you give me examples of activities that you've designed in your courses? What makes an activity? If I ask just one question like, for example, <laughs> what was the weather like yesterday? Is that an activity? Hmm? What criteria must our activities meet? How do you ensure that the activities that you've designed are cognitively demanding? Isn't it going to the objective that you're sitting mm. with the your aim of the topic you did for the day? This take you back to the outcomes, mm. not so. Mm. Do these activities relate to the outcomes? Mm -hmm. Do they help my students achieve the outcomes? Okay. Do you agree that each method has its strengths and weaknesses? Mm. Yeah. Give me an example of a technique or method you use with strength or weaknesses? In your case, it's for the first time. So I think. Are you from which discipline? Nursing. Nursing, okay. So we have cases, real life cases, that mm. we have in our module mm. Um Some of the weaknesses we found is that at not all students are at the same level, mm -hmm. or not all of them have, have worked with certain kind of conditions. So the ones that have actually worked in a ward or a CHC which got those would mm -hmm. give more input, mm -hmm. for example, um, where others would now just listen. Um, but for me, one of the, the strengths are is that you actually get the students involved mm -hmm. and they will mm -hmm. discuss where they don't just sit and listen to what If you listen. look at a good example, <coughs> right? If you look at lecturing, for example, what would be its strengths, what would be its weaknesses? We're talking about a variety of teaching and learning methods. If you look at lecturing, what would be its strengths, what would be its weaknesses? <coughs> It's the most commonly used mm -hmm. method of method of teaching at university, not so. But it has its strengths and weaknesses. Sister? I think one of the strengths is that the lecturer manages to interact with the students, but what it defines the students for is interaction among the students. Uh -huh. That is if you have not designed activities that yes, students engage in during the, the lecture. Alright? As long as we bear in mind that 
we don't have to subject our students for the whole year to lecturing, not so, or else we'll make very boring lectures. Hmm? We need to try out other things like problem solving, using cases, using tarts, and so on. Again, what is important about teaching and learning activities is that once the students are working in groups or you have a whole class discussion, you move around so as to get to know how the students are experiencing uh, this lesson. You give constructive feedback, right? In what ways does feedback promote learning? It's important that you give feedback. You don't do group work when you have not prepared for a lecture. You don't just put students in groups and make them do simply because you have not prepared for a lecture. Or simply because there's an assignment that you have to complete whilst they are doing something else. You also have to think about resources. Which resources are you going to use? Mm. We're thinking here about resources like worksheets, online assessments, what other resources, reading materials. Which resources do you use during your lectures? And why do you use those resources? <coughs> I don't know whether we are thinking. Which resources do you use? Is it only chalk and talk? No. Mm. A PC, if you want to sh show PC. how you use a, mm -hmm. uh, your computer. When demonstrate something practically on the board. Mm -hmm. the videos. videos. The textbook method. You mm. use the how do you use the textbook? Mm. Do we still use the textbook? <laughs> <laughs> How do you use it? They, we, we, because we do cases, they all the all. I will not accept an answer from you. <laughs> <laughs> mm, okay, go ahead. Carry on. Well, then then carry on. on. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we use it because. We, we work with cases, so all the information, are, it's not in our cases, but we also don't want to give information. Mm -hmm. So the students are expected to use the textbooks. As a reference tool. Mm -hmm. yeah, they not that you yeah. open the textbook mm -hmm. and you no, say no, to no, them, no, turn no, to page no, so and so, <laughs> read that, <laughs> and then answer the questions. I hope that's not what you do. Okay. They are creative <laughs> ways of using the textbook. I would yeah. okay. Some people use it for open book exams. Do you still have those? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But again, you need to look at the kinds of questions that you've set for an open book exam. Again, once we're thinking about teaching learning activities, we have to talk about support for students. Yeah. If some of your students are struggling or cannot make sense of what you do, what kind of support do you give them? You don't need an online tracking and monitoring system as a lecturer. Not so. mm. You can do that by looking at their performance. Not so. In class, who's contributing, <coughs> who is not? Why is that so? You have consultations, all right? Which other support do you give? Tutorials? Mm -hmm. Extra classes. Extra classes. classes, do you still give those? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> Assessment tasks must be meshed to, to outcomes. Ask yourself the question, why am I assess assessing my students? You can Identify three purposes of assessment. The one is diagnostic, when you want to know the level at which they are performing, okay, what they are bringing into the learning environment. All right? Because prior knowledge is very important in teaching, right? It could be diagnostic, it could be formative, it could be summative. All right? What is summative assessment? Am I asking too many questions? Mm -hmm. What is summative assessment? What is diagnostic? What is formative? These are purposes of assessment. If, for example, your purpose is to judge, 
you would, for example, design a summative assessment at the end of the module, not so. Okay? The kinds of tests we give at the end of a module are summative, not so. But formative assessment has a totally different purpose. And what is its purpose? It is to do what? To identify the gray areas that students have altogether. To, to identify <coughs> the kinds of problems they're experiencing with what you're teaching and then making sure that you assist them. Mm -hmm. So your assessment strategy answers the question, why am I assessing? What am I assessing? <coughs> when? And then you have to think about the principles. Evaluation, we've talked about evaluation already. We want to establish how effective our teaching is. And so what do we do? We use that feedback to improve our own mm -hmm. teaching. And also enable students so that they perform better. I think that's it now. I've, okay. I've addressed the elements. Yes, right yes. Go into bits. Um, listen to a video that's out. Constructive alignment theory. And as Kai already said, and I hope you learned from the activities, that the, 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 um, the elements that she talked about, it's really an idea supporting the idea that we have to be consistent in what we are doing. That when we are teaching and learning, these activities, whether it is teaching, um, whether it is the learning that the student is doing, whether it is the assessment tax or the learning outcomes, the things must speak to each other. We use those four, and if you look at the matrix, because those are really the important ones. Okay. Normally it's your learning outcomes, and then your teaching and learning activities, and we separate the two. Because when you're teaching, you're doing a, a, you're consciously doing something. Like Kaya said, you could be lecturing, you could be giving a task, but you must separate it from what the student is doing. And these days we are pushing towards having the students doing a little bit more. So yes, there is a place for the lecture method, as Kaya said, but there's also a place for the student doing something. So when we are trying to align these things, we are really trying to make sure that Everything is talking to each other. And as we're going to watch the video now, this is usually what happens when a coach is unaligned. We have very good intentions. A teacher, like, I'm sitting here in front of you, I've given you all this stuff, and I'm trying to get a message across. But maybe the way I've done it is not really getting to you. So that's what we're trying to think about. The teacher wants to explain, relate, prove, and apply, but the students are not doing that. So there's a gap, there's a gap somewhere. There's something that is not happening. So what happens? There's misal misalignment. What we are trying to push towards is the other one. And we're going to see it in the video now. Where, when you explain, the activity that you're giving them is also addressing that. So if I'm trying to apply something, if I'm trying to teach them to apply something, I give them something that will force them to do the application. So I don't tell them, you know what, we listen to many of our students, engineers, my, my son graduated from an engineering, <coughs> um, from an engineering school, not in South Africa, actually in the UK, but when he started he said, ma'am, I, I, I have never done any of these things when, when I was uh, at school. So it, 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 there's a lot of content regurgitation, and we are not teaching our students enough to think around what they think, the things that they have to do. We're not saying that, you know, take away the physics and the mathematics. We're just saying, present it in a way that the students get out of it what is supposed to be. So we are <coughs> consciously trying to say, let's design our activities so that when I say it is explained, I want them to explain something. I give them an activity where they are, what? required to explain, and then I also assess that explanation. And if I'm trying to teach them to prove something, I give them an activity where they're required to prove something, and then in the exam, that is what I'm learning. So that is what Biggs is really talking about. And in the next few minutes, we're going to watch out this video. That's why I was trying to, uh, to hurry. Oh. 
Okay, so we want now to get into some kind of group discussion to talk about the Susans and, and the Roberts a little bit. Did you find that video useful? Hmm? Hmm? Okay, so what we want you to do is to try to transfer in your groups. And these are some of the questions we want you to think about. What can I do to accommodate the Roberts and Susans? Remember the cognitive... It is that cognitive engagement, especially in higher education, that we are trying to drive at. What can we do? What type of teaching techniques and activities and assessments cuts can I use in my context? But at the same time, we don't want to go away from where the university is going. So how can we make sure that we are embedding the graduate attributes? And the reason, later on we'll be talking a little bit more deeply about the graduate mm -hmm. attributes, but if you see, we've been trying to push them because we are trying to move away of just disseminating academic and only disciplinary content, but try to match it or embed it with those skills that our students are going to, to, to use in the future. So let's take a few minutes to, in our groups and let's see if we can get some answers to, to those few questions. So but now knowing that there's a whole bunch of robbers in the class, I think that makes all the difference. Yes. Because there's, no, there's one Susan and 20 robbers. Yeah, I, I think that's also what we saw and realized that the robots are the guys we that all of this thing all of this life to I Initially, also started to come up with the, all the, all the Susans. That's where I also thought. It's daunting though, because suddenly it shifts a lot of responsibility on us as teachers. And having to really critique yourself and what you've been doing up to this point, and what you can do differently. I suppose it's all this discussion. Using the, the waiting on the topic. So this is more of the waiting and not the means. So this is the waiting that the introduction has, the waiting that the friend has, the waiting that this is. So and then these marks here? This, this is the, 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 the quality now. This is an outstanding piece to get a final. This, it is an ex excellent, it's closer, this is fair, this is weak to poor. So these are the five so options, and this is the criteria. And then when you're done, if I may go back to the... Did the IT department teach you guys how to do this alternative? Yes. Was it easy to get? It's a question of loading. They actually teach you how to load it, but they will look at We do them on our own. Like, like we, we, you can you can you use you have to do them on the cell if you have to load them on If you want the list, you get So if you load it on ten ten and the students submit the papers on the Let me just demonstrate. Yeah, just can you also do do students actually rebel against something or not rebel? That's not the right word. Do they sort of like um, turn turn away from something because? Um, what is too much? Yeah. Demanding too much from them? I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of an example, and it's maybe not a good example. Yeah. The students in the religion of the LED department, yeah. to teach them, say, Dawkins is the God's illusion, for example, they would, they, would, they would not take kindly to be taught that because that's not what, what, what they would want to expect from a religion and theology course. Mm -hmm. 
It's anti-religion and theology. I mean, isn't that the point? That's what well, I mean, I, said, I did say it was yeah. a bad example. No, 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 no. But I think we can. I think that you can. I understand the point, but I think that it's possible to do things like critical thinking within a a framework and so it doesn't have to be general critical thinking so we do quite a lot of things. I teach a lot of methodology so in terms of our outcome we try and get people to be critical of the the literature that they're reading so the research that they're reading so we try and make it applicable and then hope that in the future in terms of reading research that they'll be able to read it in a more critical way and hopefully engage with other things in a critical way but we're doing it within the frame of our course rather than general you know being critical generally so but for me I would, I would work on such an approach because indeed the whole idea of academic discourse to, to have multiple perspective. You don't necessarily have to agree with you, yeah. but isn't that what you want to encourage? Yes, yes. I, I, I just, I, 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 I slightly sort of feel disjointed about the fact that, you know, that, that you, you have, you know, about this idea of constructive alignment. Because, you know, that, that everything, you line everything up and it's all sort of like very neat and tidy. That in, whether, whether, as it, whether and, and, and I understand why it would be good to do that, generally, but whether, whether there isn't any, to any tolerance for things that don't necessarily align up in that neat sort of way. Yeah, but in reality that, 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 but, but, well, but sometimes, you, you know, people, people teach something and they learn things by accident. Yeah. You know, so is there, is there uh, the question I'm asking in my long wind brain, as I normally do, is, is there space, is there space for, 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 for non-alignment, yes. for unaligned things. Is there space for where things go awry, but yet that, it can, that, that things can still be taught? That things are taught, what I was saying, can things be taught by accident? Definitely. Can students learn Definitely. things Definitely. that were yes. not intended, yes. that it was not part of an outcome? Yes, yes. It's, yeah, but that, that's what I'm saying. You must, you must look at it in your What you just said it. now is... is my argument, but isn't that level one, the level one teacher that is safe problem and then you? No, there's a responsibility, also a responsibility for lecture. Yeah. But if you're not aligned, yeah. then, you have, then you have a problem there. But say you align your, your 10 tutorials exactly to the test, and now they don't do it and they fail. So it is aligned. Yes, it is aligned. It actually but is if it's aligned, aligned the student automatically gets forced to do it. But now you say that because we not only the assessment, you must look at the teaching, everything must be aligned. That they can actually see, say, if you give them a mock test that counts for nothing and it's aligned to what you were setting and teaching, then they should be able to do it. If they can't do it, then they have a problem at that point. Because you've got the module quality, you've got the module outcomes, you've got the module quality. Okay, you have maybe good discussion to see where they are, um, and then you have your assessment. And all of those must be aligned with each other. Um, if they do the tutorial or they don't do it, they can still be, uh, do the test because they still focus on the outcomes. But are your assessments aligned with each other? Yeah, I, I think that because remember, my test is aligned with the module outcomes. But is your test aligned the way you teach? Yeah. So if you teach an application, is your test application? Yes, no, that's the way. Because no, remember, you're saying we do really case-based right. methodology. So they get a case, they get real-life cases in class. We have, they work in groups around this case. We give them the resource material. They work out the case and they present the case in class. So it is interactive all the time. And when they go come to the test, we give them a similar case um, that is built from the one that they did in class. And it's just like some of the information will change. But there is a new assessment around because now your test is going to be like written down where your class was a little absent. Isn't it written there? Okay, guys. Can we hear some? I have very interesting discussions with the MS on it. Can we hear those? Can we share some of what we've come up with the different groups around us? I had a very encouraging debate in that corner, so I'm glad to hear the others, but they're also going to share it. <laughs>
in short, in a, in a, in a, in a practical example. <laughs> Please, thank you. In a very practical. Uh, what I did was was to 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 make every student, or I said to every student, you are going to do the practical, like the thing. They are going to do the technique, and then I would ask the rest of the students to give feedback on what the student do. So that's what I did. So is it one student or you select a few students? And I was the, in that, mm. in that, during that time I was working with 20 students. 20 students. So each one gets an opportunity to do that. Yeah. I think that is the best kind of teaching model. She says it gives them the task to do. I remember, I, I'm, you know, if somebody was to ask you, how do you milk a cow? What does that mean? Is, do you learn milking a cow by getting a picture and showing how it is it milk? Or do you really go to the cow? and milk it, it's that kind of question. So you really don't show them a picture of the cow or whatever, you take them to the cow. <laughs> and so they learn the hustles of how difficult it is, because it could kick you or whatever. But just to get to that point, he's saying actual activity of doing the actual task is one of the ways of getting, and I think it's a very important issue. Can we share something from this group? I think we just realized that because there's many more robots <laughs> we definitely have to um, have that paradigm shift that we're not teaching to the Susans anymore mm -hmm. and that we have to prep our lectures in a different way for, to accommodate these robot students. Yeah, and what, which are some of those ways? Because we are trying to get to the gist of the story. What exactly are you going to do? What activities are you going to do? <laughs> allow interaction with the student. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. A, a, a very genuine concern. We've got more robots. <laughs> As people say, <laughs> underprepared, you hear that word a lot. Robots can become Susans. Eh? Yeah, they can become Susans, but yeah. realistically, yeah. So how do we do that? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> In the first year, we have a very difficult situation actually because all, not all of the students has they have got a chemistry background, and that is is making the big problem to us. And uh, to raise up the the not you know to love the subject is another issue. To just to to implement, not to study but to love to be involved in the in the, in the teaching <coughs> process. So we are taking care, actually, we looks like that isolating those, not isolating completely, we are, but we are taking the student without background in chemistry mm -hmm. in a separate class, extra class, during the week. And then we are taking extensive teaching to them for the very basic background. And make it easy and trying to be again in the class with us. That's what we are doing actually to raise up the weak or ro robot face <laughs> that we have seen now. Okay. I don't know what your take is on this differentiated instruction. So you give more support to those who need it. Okay, some, it's, it works in some universities like UCT. I think they have camps. They have winter camps, but in, in in under-resourced universities like ours, sometimes we, we, we struggle because it means having more tutors, having more teachers to teach. But that differentiated model usually works. You just give more attention and more support to those people to get them up to the level. So that's one, one task. But sometimes it could be very res, uh, resource um, intensive and it could become very, 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 very difficult. But I think we could think about ways of how those students who need help will get more support. We spoke about Karen's method where she uses group work. Group work, yeah. Mm -hmm. If the students are given tasks in which they work, in, they work on the groups, and they actually assist on those groups and they're given tasks. Okay, group so work? Actually, the, 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 the,
Group work is also very good, but sometimes also taxing in terms of marking. Um, see how difficult it has been for even for us, the facilitators, to get you to working in groups. It requires a, a different kind of facilitation. It requires a lot of planning. It requires a lot of, but if, if it works, it, if, if, if you do it very well, it can work very well. Mm -hmm. But it just takes a little bit more effort <coughs> because you have to push the group, you have to support the group, you have to make sure that the group have got enough resources. Yeah. And our group here, I think our group here had a very nice discussion and I'm sh I would like you th for them to share it with the rest. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. <laughs> no, come on. Please share. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it's possible to really talk about everything we discussed and mm. kind of sum it up. And mm -hmm. Because I think maybe that's, that's exactly what I think we were talking about is can, can everything be summed up, packaged, and in a sense made, formulate? Um, yeah. I, th I think what we discussed yeah. was, what we spoke about was this notion of if when you have, when you ask to align everything, when you ask to align your teaching to the, to the, to the, to the, to the when your outcomes, to the assessment, to the assessment, to the outcomes, is there any room for something that's slightly messier? Something we, we, you don't necessarily have everything lined up where, be, where, where students learn by accident. Um, where, they, where they learn things that you may not have intended. But it's still learn things that are not yeah. intended. Mm. And, so, and, mm. and it's effectively, I mean, I'm asking you yeah. all we discussed that the, how much room is there for things that are, is it, is it, is it really clear that everything has to be really neat, or is there room for for things that are slightly? Yes, yeah. I think it, 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 I think they they are asking a very critical question, particularly in higher in a higher education context, and we're boxing ourselves too much, yeah, in saying that everything is, is you know step one two three four, you know there is another formula, there is another template. You know, there's another template you must feel. There's another thing. So aren't we boxing ourselves too much? And, and, and the answer is we are to some extent because we are required, because we, we've gone into this. Universities are entering the corporate culture of accountability, kind of. So we have to and showcase compliance. what and the compliance, the whole compliance idea is, is creeping in us. But I think as academics, we have a reason to, to, to start. Um, this is why we are here, to start talking about how, what can we do differently, okay? If this template is not working, what can we do to raise the bar so that our students are meeting the, the things that they're... Yeah. So those questions are there, and we're boxing ourselves too much if we're saying learning outcome of the line, you know, you know, and I must give you the rubric and I must give you the other template. Is that the learning that we want to happen uh, at the academic level? So I think we, we must think in the continuum and see, see to what extent we can take each thing. But remember, we are accountable to other people. That's why you are here, because you want to finish your portfolio, because that is the way you are going to be promoted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. so, so I think we must find ways of balancing, but intelligently, in, in a way that, that works for us. But I think that's a very critical question. Yeah, it, is. It, is. It, is, it is a very critical question. The whole outcome-based learning yeah. Um, proved, I mean, you could argue it both ways. Some people will say it's too behaviorist because it's just specifying every little thing to the, you know, is it that, is it this what we require at our university level? But on the other hand, as I was just explaining to them, if we take, for instance, the graduate attributes, which are very high level, mm -hmm. if our intention is to make sure that our students are critical, mm -hmm. okay, then we could ask ourselves, how do we uh, operationalize this? How do we make our students become more critical and more engaged? Okay, so what are the activities that we can use to shape, to shake them up so that they become these, you know, very self-reflective and very independent <laughs> individuals? So I think it's, it's at that stage where we, we have to think about it. And that's why we need to articulate it. 
Because if we are not articulated, we won't know what is it that we're doing. But please add to this discussion. I don't want to be talking about myself. Yes. No, I was going to say he has raised a very pertinent question. Because one of the criticisms leveled against outcomes-based education is the fact that it is too prescriptive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the question that comes up then is, how do we ensure that we stretch our students? If you remember from one of my slides, I mentioned that if you're thinking in terms of content, you're looking at, for example, the essential knowledge what they should learn, what they could learn, and the nice to have. So for me, the answer lies in, in making sure that you do not restrict your students to the essential and the, and the, and the should have knowledge. You also you know, raise the bar a bit and include stuff that's going to empower your students. Mm. Yes, please add to that conversation. Yeah, it doesn't build exactly on your point, but mm -hmm. one of the, just the challenges we were talking about is that we would, we'd like to work with we all, the Roberts and the Susans, mm -hmm. but one of the challenges is that because we're so good at putting all our things on Ikamba, we're finding students aren't coming to lectures. So sometimes mm -hmm. it's a real challenge to get students to engage with each other and work and keep working as a group um, together. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how other lecturers have found that, but it's a... It's a real <coughs> challenge. You know, you might have, you feel all your ducks know, you've got your assessments, you've got your reviews, you've got everything, but you, you mm -hmm. don't have students coming to lectures. Any suggestions, any ideas of how it has worked? I have not heard anywhere where it says it's always marks. I, I don't know. Well, so some people would say it's a very, it's a very, um, what kind of, it's a very shallow way of looking at it. But our, our students are only encouraged by marks. Yeah. So well, whatever you value, if you value, they will come. If you give a mark to it, they will do it. Unfortunately, because our systems have emphasized the mark so much, and I don't think we're going to get away from it. Other universities have been saying we'll get away from the marking, but I'm yet to see an institution which has moved away from this assessment. So assessment seems to be the driver. And if we can shape it so that we value and mark those things. The other day I was talking to the statistics department and they were telling me exactly the same thing. Students are not coming to class. Mm. So what, what do we do now? What, well, are we going to push them? Okay, and the one of the very, um, not very old, yeah. well, no. Uh, that, 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 that's not a right, mature, that's not a right characterization. <laughs> one of the mature lecturers said that actually for me, for my class, and it's a very quiet, uh, gentleman, you wouldn't th think. He said he has 80% attendance and it's because he gives them a mark. Sure. But it's, the mark is not for attending, but the mark is for the test. He gives them, his teacher's mark and gives them one question. <coughs> so you have to be there to do that question because it's going to count. So yeah. everybody has got to be there to do, the, to do, that, to do that mark. Yeah. So these are some of the, but you know, to what extent can you do it in your thingy, I am not sure. So yeah. just one more thing, mm. um, uh, linking to the lecture we had last week mm. on Vygotsky's theory about the yeah. proximal development and teaching to that gap between where the student is and where mm. you're yeah. going to yeah. take yeah. Yeah. I think one of the challenges we sit with the UWC is having enormous classes, so class numbers of 240 or 250 students, and trying to find out where that gap is and mm. how you fit in and make the difference. <coughs> Mm. So, I, I mean, apart from students not coming to lectures, just being able to feel like you can manage to somehow meet that gap. Any suggestions? So it, no, it's, it's part of mm. the previous point. Mm. So do you want to come back mm. to it? Oh, no, no, please. Go ahead. Okay. No, I just wanted to make a point about educational technology that I think UWC lecturers have embraced it a lot. Mm. But it's, it can be used to fulfill a very traditional kind of function mm -hmm. of um, just sharing resources to transmit knowledge, whereas I think that there is potential on Ikamba and also other, other types of technologies to facilitate a lot of interaction among students as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I, I kind of think like Ikamba and the, all the extra technology kind of makes it worse for a Robert, wouldn't it? 
Um, um, Please share it. It's the whole engagement that Robert needs, mm. and then his name is Robert, right? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and then we want to put everything online, and we want, you know, so the students have to do it themselves. It's actually going to worsen the problem, I would imagine, than, you know, to go in that direction. And then my other thing, I just wanted to, I don't know, um, if, you know, it said on the, or, you know, in that movie, 20, 30 years ago, there was all the Susans and some very mm -hmm. little Roberts. Um, so I guess technically then, looking at everyone's age, we were all then the Susans. <laughs> <laughs> right, so we were all taught in that traditional yeah, way yeah. with the lecture, and then we got our butts in gear, and mm. we did the work, and we studied, and there was no real tutors or any of these yeah, yeah. things. I just want to know what happened to the Susans, and why, where did all the Roberts come from? Yes. I'm not, I'm not being funny or mean. I just I want to know yeah. where the past the past the 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 increasing the number of people coming to universities. Yeah. I think they so that's, that's, what that's what it is. That's what it is. It still mm. seems like there's a lot less, st even statistically, sorry, I interrupted yeah. you. It seems like it's, there's still a much smaller proportion than Susan's. And it's not, it's not just, you know, you can't see the UWC or it's, I mean, you look at the teaching and learning, all the universities are yeah, doing it. So, yeah. and that's not necessarily because of more students coming, you know, they're doing it in the States as well. And they've had, you know, universities Major, much mm. more, um, you know, any any yeah, answers to this one? Students mm? quantity. I mean, mm? I, you know what we look but I, I I find Sorry. it a very very problematic formulation about that. Simply, it's just because of numbers. That therefore you have now have more. Because it, it is, there's something 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 there which I'm not quite comfortable with, and that suggests that um, because the higher class had access to education in the past, therefore they produced Susans. And that with the access to lower classes of people in, in, the, in, in society, that therefore you now have more of it. So that, that's no. a very problematic formulation. Now, mm. and that, that, mm. that's mm. what can be leading to what, yeah. what he said there. And I think that's, you know, because um, some of us might not, you know, some of us who come from the lower classes, um, you know, we want to guard ourselves as being Roberts. I don't know. I mean, right. Some of us are Roberts and we... Um, <laughs> Mark. No, 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 no. I, don't, I don't know if this is the point we should be debating. I see what you're saying, Mark, but it could then be the culture of late capitalism. But the other thing that it is, the assumption is not that the Roberts come from the lower classes. In fact, quite the opposite. The middle class is handicapped. Because middle class... I mean, you look at what's happening in places like China. These, they're, they're growing this generation of people that don't do anything for themselves. They're being serviced by their grandparents and, and their parents because they're affluent. So really what's at, what's at stake and what I think, I, I think maybe the Roberts actually come from affluence and not the other way around. That no, there's no great, the, the people in, in fighting the culture of poverty theory say there's no greater motivator than poverty. Well, I, don't think it, I don't think it has anything to do with the income mm. in, <coughs> in South African or any other context, mm, mm. I, I really don't. Mm. Um, I don't. Mm. Because, because then if it's happening globally, then how can that explain, how can that be explained by my income? Mm. <laughs> so it's not just here. Yeah, no, it it's just, just seems here. to be. No, I mean, it's another teaching and learning thing where, where um, the professors from New York University were here and they're, you know, doing the same thing. The same because thing. Because they're having the same problems. Mm. But, but fundamentally, I think we, we, we have to look for these problems and we are, the answers are not going to be very easy. Yes, sorry? Yeah, um, I'm actually, um, uh, I'm not worried about the attendance of the student. If the student doesn't like to come, he's, he's, he's he, he, won't, he doesn't like to come. But we have to, if, if we are speaking about the large, huge number of students, we have to, to, to consider this organization with a big number. This is a natural phenomenon. I mean that if you have 200, not like 30 students, you can control the 30 students and all of them will come. But 200, you will find only 50, which they, they, they will come to your, and then the 50, you will take care of the 50 because they won't to come. Yeah. And some of them are Robert and some of them are Suzanne. So you are taking care of Robert mm -hmm. of that 50. 
But if they are not attending also, what you are going to do? Can I just maybe say, mm -hmm. uh, for me, it, it's actually not a problem to have a robot. For me, a robot is actually very challenging. Mm -hmm. And it excites my teaching because it always makes me think, what can I do? To improve it. Mm -hmm. To improve it. And then I've got a daughter that's a Susan and a son <laughs> that's a robot. <laughs> <laughs> because I love working with him, so I can talk about it. Yeah. But he is much more creative than what she mm -hmm. is. And he also really challenges you. And I've, I've learned by living with him. And for him, is he comes to class and he's got a lecturer that reads everything from the PowerPoint slides. So he comes home and says, Mom, it's boring. I can read. I don't mm. need somebody to and read for me. Yeah. So I also don't believe that attendance really makes a good student. I had once a student that never attended, and she passed, passed. better than some of the students that mm. attended all the time. But what I want, I'm trying to say is that we, be, we, we need both and we shouldn't actually see the robots as being a, a problem. I, I think that actually makes the classes much more exciting. Mm -hmm. And for him, for example, I would say, and what he does to study is he will record sometimes himself while he's playing his FIFA games or gymming, running on the treadmill in the mm -hmm. gym. He will play that on his MP3 or whatever mm -hmm. he's got. And he makes use of a lot of... Um, the YouTubes, because they want to see visual things also. I've noticed with the robots, they, they, they don't just want somebody talking to you, they, they want to find things out kind of <coughs> for themselves. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the robots, I think for me over the years, they've been my challenges, and they actually make your classes sometimes much more exciting. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, I think we've extended the robot, but I think you, you kind of get the point of where we are trying to go. This could, should have been our last assignment, but I don't think we're going to have time to do it. But we can, no, you can carry it on, okay? What we wanted you to, I think you can take it as homework. <coughs> so what we wanted was you was to look at that blank activity. And somebody was asking me in that group, it seems we're repeating ourselves each, each, uh, each, each uh, these are things that are next explanatory. But I think if you see the, where we are going, we are now trying to make sure you articulate these things that you are doing. Do you understand? When you are designing something, articulate what is it that you are doing. What, are, what, are, what actually, what is your goal? What's your outcome, whether it's high or low? And what are the teaching activities? So this is what we had wanted you to do, to just select one learning outcome of your choice and design one teaching activity and design one learning activity and then also think about how it could link to one of the graduate attributes. Obviously we're not going to get time to do that now but I think we will carry it on. We have other sessions where we're going to be looking at learning outcomes and graduate attributes so we can, but in the meantime revisit your module outcomes and trying to, to articulate these things a little bit more clearly to, for yourself. And make sure if there are new things that are coming up, all of you are quite the young generation, so you could have had older people who have done other things, but we are expecting you to also produce new things.